The next presentation fits in really well. You may not be able to tell it by the title as far as that goes, but as you read through the work, as, I, as, I've, as, as, as I've done, uh, David Blanchett's paper really fits in well with, I, th I believe, with a lot of the things that we've, you know, that we've talked about in here today. I, uh, you know, many, many of you students have heard me say to you, uh, I, we want, you want to learn about investments, and you think I, somehow there's some sort of holy grail out here that we're going to teach you, so you're going to be able to get rich quick, and you're going to be able to manage your investments well. And you probably have heard me say is that all these financial assets that you have, uh, are just simply financial assets. You have no control over them basically once you buy them. I mean, you think you do, but they're, they're it's other people's businesses and things that you're buying, and they're pieces of paper, but there's only there's one asset that you do have right now that you have absolute total control over, and that's your human capital. That's what you're sitting in, and that's your education, and what you make of yourself. You have total control over that. And what, what, what David's paper, what he's going to be talking about, is no portfolio is an island, is to bring in those aspects of investing, if you will, other than our financial assets and how important that is in the context of financial planning to pick out, you know, to include that in, in, the, in the planning that we do for individuals and, and families. Uh, we're really fortunate to have David here. In fact, as I, as I read through what, what David has on his, on his resume, uh, it's, it's very impressive. He's got more letters after his name than most people that I know. Uh, and, that's, and most people I know, they're happy they don't have that many letters after their name. But he's got a lot of letters after his name. He's in charge of research, uh, retirement research for Morningstar Investment Management. Uh, do, doing this, his research works primarily in the area of financial planning tax planning, annuities, and retirement plans, and he serves as chairman of the Advice Methodologies Investment Subcommittee. Uh, prior to joining Morningstar, he was director of consulting and investment research for the Retirement Plan Consulting Group at Unified Trust Company in Lexington, Kentucky. He does reside in, in, in Lexington, Kentucky, I believe, still. Um, his work's been published in, in a wide variety of industry journals, Financial Analyst Journal, the Journal of Financial Planning, and the Journal of Wealth Management. He's been featured in popular news publications such as Investment News, Market Watch, Money Magazine, The New York Times, Plan Sponsor Magazine, and The Wall Street Journal. In 1912, his research won uh, the, from the Retirement Income Industry Association. He got the Thought Leadership Award. In 2014 and 2015, the Journal of Financial Planning gave him the Montgomery Warshire Award. Uh, which is actually a pretty prestigious award within that particular group. Because uh, I know Dr. Warshaw, it's got to be good or it's not gonna, he's not going to be given the award. There's no doubt about that. In 2014, Money Magazine named him as one of the five brightest minds in retirement planning in the U.S. 2014 Investment News included him in their inaugural 40 under 40 list uh, as a visionary for the financial planning industry. Uh, he serves as an expert retirement panelist for the Wall Street Journal, and I think he's probably still under the age of 40 as far as that goes. Are you? Yes, sir. Uh, you're, oh, he's 34 years of age. Uh, I had a newborn at that age. That was what I was doing. Uh, he has a bachelor's degree in finance and economics from the University of Kentucky, a master's degree from the American College, and a master's degree in business administration from the University of Chicago. And, but currently, he's a doctoral candidate trying to get his dissertation written so that he can have a Ph.D. at Texas Tech University. So please join me in welcoming David Blanchett. Great. Thank, uh, thank you. So, um, you know, first, I went to Kentucky, and you guys played Kentucky in football earlier this year, didn't you? I just thought I'd start with that. Sorry, sorry. You know. <laughs> Wait a minute. We're, that would make us, what, three and one against you? Probably, yeah. <laughs> Probably eight and one all the time. Um, well, my name is David Blanchett. I work at Morningstar. So uh, today's presentation is No Portfolio is an Island. So, um, you know, big crowd today. You guys can ask questions whenever you want to. So I'm going to go through about, about 60 slides. Um, some concepts pretty fast. If you have a question, just raise your hand ask me. I can um, take them throughout. So uh, today's presentation is No Portfolio is an Island. And um, it actually comes from this, this poem um, by John Dunn. It was a I forget, he's like an astrophysicist or something. And so he said that, you know, effectively that, you know, we're all a part of something, right? That no person exists on their own. And I think that, you know, this is, you know, oftentimes how we view portfolios, is this kind of isolated thing that we can build and make efficient. And so in today's presentation, I'm going to cover kind of four different ways to think about building more efficient portfolios. Okay, the first is talking about total wealth. So looking at, for example, a household, um, a business, a charity, 
you know, what are the unique risks associated with those investors and how would that affect the portfolio? Uh, the next is, is a goal, right? You know, you, you save money to accomplish a goal and the risks of that goal should affect how you build your portfolio. Uh, the next is an income focus. If you have a, a focus on creating income from a portfolio, what does that mean for um, an efficient portfolio? And finally, time. If you have an investment duration of, say, five years versus 20 years, what does that mean for the actual kind of most efficient, you know, allocation for your portfolio? So at a high level, when, when it comes to designing and building portfolios, we actually do this. I work for what's called Morningstar Investment Management. We're an RIA at Morningstar that builds uh, portfolios for clients. We manage about uh, $200 billion. And we have this whole you know, process we talk about. it. This is what we call the wheel. Okay, and the first thing you do is you have your capital market assumptions. Those are your expectations for the return on stocks and bonds. You kind of figure out what is the strategic target for your portfolio. Um, you build your managers. You say, I want to pick this active manager, this passive manager. Uh, then you build a portfolio, you monitor it. And so this is kind of the ongoing process. And today's presentation is about one part of this entire wheel. This is just thinking, how do you design portfolios with that strategic asset allocation? This is kind of the, uh, the second part of that. And you know, one thing that I talk to a lot of financial advisors, and I'm sure that I'm hoping most of you have heard of the efficient frontier, right? You've taken an investments course. You know, the efficient frontier um, is just this idea that you should only buy portfolios that are, um, have the highest return per unit of risk. Okay, so on this slide, you'll see an example of a, a good and bad portfolio. That, that blue line is the efficient frontier, and the good portfolio is on the efficient frontier. Okay, the bad portfolio is, is underneath it, right? And, and, you know, so I spend a lot of time building portfolios for clients. A lot of the guys I work with do. And I think that, you know, too often we do this in isolation. Okay, too often we'll, you know, we'll have these inputs, we'll have, you know, expected returns, we'll have this covariance matrix, we'll have these different models, and we'll, we'll build these really efficient portfolios that say you should allocate, you know, 12.4256% to small value or something kind of incredible. And so I think that the problem with that, though, is it isn't really addressing the other stuff. You know, a really kind of a comprehensive view, because in reality, there's only one free lunch in investing, that's diversification. Right, so this is a, a slide showing you kind of, you know, how, you know, different asset classes have fared over time. There's, you know, small cap stocks, large cap stocks, international, et cetera. I mean, you know, I mean, here in Markowitz's, you know, kind of theorem on, on investing was this idea that diversification is, is, is the only free lunch that's out there. And that's the kind of the key here where, where, you know, thinking about these other risks, these other models, helps you build better portfolios that are more diversified and therefore creates a unique form of alpha. You can't get through uh, portfolio selection alone. And, you know, for better or for worse, you know, for those of you that are financial advisors, this means that there really isn't one portfolio for everyone. Right? I really understand the compliance reasons why you would design a set of, you know, six or eight or 12 model portfolios. But in reality, if you could do it right and you could spend the time, every client would have a unique portfolio based upon their facts and circumstances. Now, I'm not expecting people to do that um, today, but, you know, I think that the goal with all of this is to say, well, how do these different factors really come into play when thinking about what is the right portfolio for you, the right portfolio for your clients, one of these days, for those of you who are students who actually enter uh, this profession. So uh, the first perspective or kind of the approach is a total wealth perspective, right? And the idea here is that what, what, what is an, a, an individual's balance sheet? Okay, well, there's obviously two sides. There's assets and liabilities, okay? And I think that it's important to think about both holistically. Okay, so you know, the title of today's presentation is, is No Portfolio is an Island. I already kind of talked about this kind of central premise, which is just that you shouldn't build portfolios in isolation. You shouldn't just say, ah, you know, I have these inputs for a portfolio, I'm going to design it, and then, and then rebalance it back to this target. The key is asking yourselves, well, what makes my client unique or different than the average investor? And so we've been doing research on this now for um, over a decade. There was a piece that came out back in 2007 called Lifetime Financial Advice. It's actually part of the CFA curriculum. It talks about this idea. Um, and I wrote a piece that was just in the Financial Analyst Journal published um, about six months ago. You know, it kind of digs deeper into this idea kind of asking the question, you know, how do you really think about investing for a household efficiently? Okay, and, and this is kind of the, the key premise, where you have, you have, you know, the tradable, you know, we'll call it the island portfolio. So you've got their financial wealth. Okay, and financial wealth is things like a 401k, an IRA, a taxable account. It's, it's liquid assets. Um, you've also got other stuff. Okay, the other stuff is really important. We'll talk about the other stuff in this presentation. Uh, three examples of other stuff that are very, very important are human capital, which think of it as kind of the net present value of your future earnings, uh, your housing wealth, the equity in your home, as well as your pension wealth, uh, so, uh, so things like Social Security, 
Okay? If you're targeting a balanced portfolio, let's just call it just hypothetically 45% uh, stocks, you, know, you really can't trade human capital, housing wealth, and pension wealth. Right. Um, obviously, housing wealth, you can sell your home. But the key here is using that, that tradable portfolio, that island portfolio, thinking about what are the risks of the other assets to have a kind of total efficient portfolio. Right. So think about your kind of tradable and non-tradable wealth and, and utilize your liquid assets to kind of fill in the holes that you can't fill in with your non-tradable wealth. And what this has, it has kind of actually two impacts on the portfolio. Okay. The first impact is on the equity allocation targets. So how risky should your portfolio be? How much is the allocation to have to, for, to stocks and bonds, for example? The other piece is on the asset allocation. Right. How much do you allocate to um, you know, small cap value, to REITs, um, to high yield bonds, et cetera? Okay. So this is kind of an overview of the idea. And so the first kind of perspective is, is for households. Okay. So for those of you that do financial plans, you've probably seen this, this, this graphic before. This is, this is the mountain. Right. This is someone's, uh, we'll just call it their 401k balance. Okay. So when they first start working at age 25, um, they have very or little, if any, kind of tradable portfolio wealth. As they save for retirement, their portfolio gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. They retire at 65, and then it kind of goes downhill. Okay. This is the mountain. Okay. And, and for a lot of people, this is the only glimpse that they see as part of their overall comprehensive balance sheet. This, you know, these are just the assets. Well, in reality, there's kind of other aspects to assets for a household. I've already talked about three of these. So again, there's, there's financial capital. That's your, um, that's your portfolio, your IRA, your 401k, et cetera. You've also got human capital, housing wealth, and pension wealth. Okay? And when you, when you combine these, this is someone's total wealth. Now, there's also liabilities. Right? So with your financial capital, you know, uh, why, do you, you know, why do we save? We save to accomplish a goal. Right? You save money to pay for college, to pay for retirement. You save it for something directly. That's, that's the liability. You know, with human capital, you use it to fund consumption. Right? Most of your earnings let your lifetime fund your lifestyle. It you know, helps you pay for the house to live in, you know, clothes to wear, and food to eat. You know, with a house, there's a mortgage. And with pensions, there's also retirement. So all these assets have these liabilities. But you know, if we go back to this graphic, this is just a view of your financial assets, just your portfolio. Okay? This is a view of, of everything holistically. Okay, and so what, and the key here is, is to change your perspective. Well, what is this person's wealth? I and mean, this is just an asset perspective. But if you notice, you know, that, that mountain is still in there. Okay, that blue mountain, you know, that shows that portfolio is growing over time and then declines as the age is still there. But it's only one part of this much bigger puzzle. Right, so they've got, they've got human capital, that, that, that purple region, They've got um, the, the green region is, is pension wealth. They'll think, think of that as accrued Social Security benefits. And then the orange is, is, is the equity in their home. Okay, and so, you know, if you kind of go to the very far left, you know, their only asset is, is effectively human capital, right? When you graduate from school, for those of you that are in school currently, you're not going to have a whole lot of money when you graduate. You might not actually negative wealth with student loans, right? And so the key then is thinking about, well, you know, how does this, you know, how does this wealth transition over time? Okay, so if your dominant asset when you're younger is human capital, and then you kind of utilize that human capital and you, you transform it into, into savings and accruing pension wealth and real estate, well, you know, a question then is, you know, how should these different, you know, factors affect your portfolio allocation, right? Because if you build a portfolio based entirely on inputs such as expected returns, um, you know, standard deviations and correlations, and you ignore this other stuff, you're missing this, this big piece of the puzzle, right, which is how the other wealth affects what the right portfolio is. Right, so well, first we'll talk about, about human capital. And human capital is, is you know, it's got theory going back over, over 40 or 50 years in terms of, you know, why or how it matters to portfolios. And this is kind of three different um, providers today of, of target date funds that are used, you know, commonly in 401k plans, where you a portfolio targets a certain retirement date, and that's the allocation you get. Um, and if you, you, can, you can read the quotes if you want to, but there's just different perspectives about why and how this is so important. Okay, why human capital should be considered when it comes to you know, determining the asset allocation for an investor. Right? And so people you know, often say, well, you know, human capital, you know, well, big deal. Okay, so you know, you know, this is you know, kind of tongue in cheek, but what can possibly go wrong when you think about human capital? Well, there's endless possibilities. Okay, well, what do I mean here? Well, you know, Enron is, 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 is a perfect example of a company that had a significant overinvestment in, in their human capital, the, the employees did. So, you know, people, you know, look back today and they say, well, Enron, you know, it was, it was obvious it was going to fail. 
The Enron was named as the most innovative company, um, I think, in the world, or at least in the U.S., by Fortune for six straight years. Okay, there was no real indication they were going to fail before they did. Okay, but a lot of Enron employees, though, they had, they had almost most or all their 401k invested in Enron stock. Okay, um, they had their job at Enron. Let's just say that they lived in a neighborhood with other Enron employees. Okay, when Enron failed, what happened to that person? Okay, they, they lost their 401k, they lost their job, and they probably couldn't sell their home. Okay, they did not diversify their assets. You know, you know, diversification is this kind of free lunch, and so they ignored this idea that, hey, I should think about the risks of my human capital when it comes to investing in my portfolio. Right? I'm usually very against the idea of um, investing in employer securities. So Morningstar's not here, so I'll say this. You know, we get uh, restricted stock at Morningstar. As soon as I get mine, I sell it. Um, because I have enough risk in Morningstar right now. I, I want to diversify my risk as best I can. And so I think that when you think about clients, you've got to ask yourself, well, you know, well, how risky is human capital? Right? And so I think that, you know, Moshe Molesky is probably, you know, one of the, 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 the most profound researchers in this field. You know, I wrote this book um, a long time ago and asked this great question, are you a stock or are you a bond? Okay, and this is kind of the central question behind thinking about human capital risk theory. Right? So, I mean, you can ask yourself, you know, how risky is, is my job, my occupation, what I do? And if you think about, you know, okay, you know, total wealth diversification, the riskier your job is, you know, uh, the safer your human capital should be, right? And so um, we actually had a, a committee back in, back in Ibbotson, um, you know, about 15, 20 years ago. And they actually kind of had to ask this question. And there's a bunch of smart folks on it, you know, Roger Ibbotson, Dick Thaler, Danny Kahneman, Harry Markowitz, uh, Shlomo Bernardsi, et cetera. And, and they actually called human capital a junk bond. Right, so they think that your human capital is a junk bond, and it's kind of a joke. Um, but the idea is that is that you know your earnings capacity as an individual. Okay, when times are good, it's it's relatively bond-like. Okay, but when the markets go south, it's much like an equity; it kind of loses its value. And so they kind of you know they just esoterically said, okay, uh, human capital is going to be 30% stocks um, and 70% bonds. Okay, and so. Um, we actually tested this theory. This is the only equation in my entire presentation, I promise. Um, but we did what's called uh, the, the Fama French five-factor model. and These are the terms this, this explains. And all we're looking for is what, what this coefficient is, is what is the equity allocation for different jobs, okay? And, you know, long story short, um, there's a significant difference in the risks of different jobs. And that's somewhat intuitive, right? And so, you know, for example, then, so these are different industries at the top. There's construction, finance, government, healthcare, uh, lodging, manufacturing, mining, real estate, transportation, and utilities. And so, you know, I kind of have highlighted two examples on this, on this slide. And one is, is for government worker, and one is someone who works as like a realtor, for example. Okay, if you work in the government, you have a relatively bond-like form of human capital. You have a, a, a quasi, you know, guaranteed job. And so we just, we found that, you know, I wouldn't look too far into the numbers, but that it is, um, uh, 5% stock like, okay? Uh, a realtor, it was more like 40% stock like, and, and, and really the, uh, just the key here is that, is that how someone, you know, who works for the government versus a realtor, they, they should incorporate these ideas into their uh, portfolio construction process. You shouldn't ignore the fact you work for the government or real estate when designing your portfolio. And so this is an example of kind of how this works at a really, really high level. Um, you know, on, on the far left, you'll see uh, the right portfolio for someone in isolation. And this is, again, there's a lot of assumptions, just kind of roll with this for a second. Um, and let's just call that portfolio 19% stock-like, okay? If you look in the middle, the middle part of this is saying, okay, well, human capital is relatively bond-like. So when I incorporate this idea of you having your portfolio, and you having this bond-like human capital exposure, the optimal total wealth portfolio becomes more aggressive. It's just acknowledging that one of your assets is relatively safe, you can take on more risk in the rest of your portfolio. So this is what that kind of looks like hypothetically for a professor and for a realtor. Okay, the professor, you know, again, they have a relatively safe job, especially if they've got tenure. A realtor is far, is far riskier, and so that professor can, can choose to take a more risk in their portfolio. They have more risk capacity. Now, they may have, you know, different risk preference, though. Right, so they, you know, they may choose to take on less risk because they want to, but at a high level, you know, thinking about the risks of human capital suggests they'd have different target asset allocations overall. Now, another example of this is thinking about things like guaranteed income. Okay, so let's just say we have, have, a, have a retiree. Okay, he's going to retire tomorrow. Okay, and, 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 and the target allocation for his wealth is 55% bonds and 45% stocks. 
Okay, and let's say that this person wants to go out and buy uh, an immediate fixed annuity or a single premium immediate annuity. Okay, how should that affect their portfolio? Okay, well, an island perspective would say, well, Mr. or Mrs. Client or whomever, you should buy this annuity and then rebalance back to target. However, you know, a total wealth perspective would say, well, wait a minute. You know, what are the risk characteristics of an immediate fixed annuity? Okay, it's very much like holding a bond. Right, because if you if you have this annuity every single year you receive or every month you receive this guarantee payment like the coupon from a bond, and so a total wealth perspective might say, wait a minute, well maybe what you should do is source that that purchase from your bond assets and leave your portfolio alone. Okay, so what that does it makes your portfolio more aggressive, but holistically, your overall asset al allocation hasn't changed. Right, and so what this means for us longer term is this idea of you know building kind of more efficient portfolios across like three dimensions. Right, so you have, you know, you have you know, allocations that vary by age, equity allocation, and total wealth. So we're actually working on this today, for example, in the custom target date space. So we actually build a custom glide pass for relatively large 401k plans, thinking about these different risks. Now, at the end of the day, though, I think the key to all of this is taking you know, this total wealth perspective, incorporating all these different you know, attributes, characteristics, and preferences when it comes to determining the allocations to investments into products. I don't think that you should, you should recommend to a client, hey, you should you know, go buy this annuity and have this portfolio. I think that you should determine all this holistically. I think that that's where you know, this profession has been moving towards in a long time, but it's this idea that it really matters to think about all of someone's stuff uh, versus just their portfolio. Now, you know, this idea of total wealth applies to really every type of investor. Okay, so I've got, you know, two quick examples uh, and other kind of um, platforms. Another example is for, is for charities. Okay, so when we think about charities, you know, you can think about, you know, you know, Harvard is not a charity, but they've got a very large endowment. Okay, so a question then is, you know, how should someone invest their endowment? Okay, well, again, if you view the endowment in isolation, you would, you know, you'd, you'd build this you know, mean, variance efficient portfolio. But if you think about, about most charities, most of their wealth is actually in the form of donations. Okay, most of their operating budget comes from donations. And so, you know, there's actually risks, though, to different types of, of donations. And so, you know, long story shorter, we're in this analysis looking at, you know, different, you know, you know, different types of charities, and it really does matter where you get your money from. And so, you know, just, you know, an example of this would be, um, let's say you've got a, a charity, and most of the folks that are on your, the board of the charity, like the main committee, work for a bank, right? If you want to diversify the risk of your total wealth for that charity, you would kind of underweight bank stocks or large cap value in your portfolio to diversify that, uh, that unique risk associated with, um, you know, the, the members on your board, right? So another example of this is, is pension plans or defined benefit plans. Um, and, you know, defined benefit plans are obviously declining in popularity. They're not near what they were uh, 20 or 30 years ago, but they really still are um, a big deal for a lot of companies, okay? The average uh, defined benefit plan is about 10% of the market cap of the underlying company. So, but there's actually some big differences. So, for example, a Northrop Grumman's DV plan was equal to its market cap of $25 billion um, a few years ago. Okay, so, you know, if you've been, if you've been paying attention, hopefully you have been, um, you'll know that, you know, that, okay, so let's think about a company, right? There are aspects to a firm that would affect how it should invest its pension, right? And so, again, you can run an analysis and figure out, okay, given, you know, the unique risks of, of you know, how that company operates, where it operates, how should it affect its portfolio? This is, for example, how the portfolio should differ um, for 49 different industries. So there's, there's huge differences in the, al in the optimal portfolio allocations um, by firm, by industry. And so, you know, what's interesting, you do this analysis and actually look at, so then I said, okay, that, you know, in theory, again, if, if you have a riskier firm, okay, so if you are working for Google versus, say, GE, in theory, Google should take on um, less risk in its pension because it has a riskier kind of, you know, earnings capacity than, than, say, GE does, okay? And so, in theory, you know, there should be this relationship between the risk of the firm and the allocation in their defined benefit plan, uh, but there's really not at all. So no one cares. Um, I looked at you know, how the actual allocations differ across firms. And there's really no relationship at all. So this suggests that firms that do not really tend to care all that much um, about you know, the risk capacity of the firm given their total wealth. So, um, next is what's called a liability relative investing. Okay? And the key here really is just this idea that you know, why, do, why do we actually save for anything? Right? I mean, if someone is saving for retirement, it's to, it's to accomplish a goal. Right? And so the key here is that, is that goals have unique risks. 
right? To every goal, there's this underlying liabilities. And so that kind of begs the question, what is the true risk of a portfolio? Okay, um, it's, not, it's not standard deviation, okay? But that's the common metric we use when it comes to doing like mean variance optimization, right? It's not benchmark risk. It's did I you know, outperform the S&P last quarter, okay? It's achieving the goal. Right? What was I able to actually accomplish the goal? And so if you change your perspective and say, you know what, I want to build portfolios that are efficient given the risks of my goal, you get very different outcomes. Okay, so on this slide you'll see uh, two different portfolios. Uh, one is optimized to hedge the risk of inflation. The other is optimized based upon total return. Okay, they have the exact same expected return of 6%, but they couldn't be more different. Right, so, and why this is important is, you know, if, if you're a financial planner, and a client walks into your office and they have uh, the accumulation focused portfolio and you, you do kind of traditional mean variance optimization techniques, you may say to yourself, well, you have a really efficient portfolio, right? But if you take a different perspective, you say, hey, wait a minute, you know, the goal here is to have an efficient portfolio that returns, you know, a good amount of money after inflation, you reach a very different conclusion than the one on the left. And so what does this look like? Okay, so, you know, when we build uh, glide paths for companies, obviously the equity allocation changes over time. It gets more conservative as the person approaches retirement. Um, but you know, there's also these kind of interesting differences within the, st the, the stock and bond pieces, right? So uh, for a younger investor within the stock allocation, there's more international equities, more emerging markets, and more small cap. Okay, within the bond piece, there's more nominal bonds, more long duration, more credit exposure, and more non-U.S. bonds. And as you move towards retirement, um, the bond piece becomes shorter duration and more tips focused, um, and, and the stock piece is more domestic and more alts. And so this idea that, you know, based upon where you're in your life cycle, the actual, again, kind of allocations, intra stock, intra bond, should vary significantly based upon the goal you're trying to achieve. Now, uh, the next idea is on, is on income. And so um, the key here is that uh, investors aren't always rational. Right? If you've worked with clients, you've maybe had a few experiences that are memorable. And I, I've had quite a few. Um, and you know, clients often don't have um, consistent preferences. They have different things. And one common you know, goal among retirees is this idea of, I want income from my portfolio. OK, well, it's kind of silly because you know, a client should be indifferent between realizing income from, say, coupons or dividends uh, versus you know, selling a stock and then realizing some dividends. You know, they should be different between, you know, where the income comes from, but some clients really care, right? And so you can think of this kind of decomposing total return and a price return and income return, right? So the total return of a, of a stock is going to be its price return, which is its appreciation, along with dividends, which is the income return, right? So for bonds, um, there usually is no price return. There's, there's only income return. But this is kind of showing you um, how those two pieces fit together for, you know, stocks and bonds historically. Right, so you know, not surprisingly, uh, most of the risk for investments comes in the price return. Um, the income return has been somewhat consistent for stocks over the last, um, say, 90 years. Um, a little more volatile in long-term government bonds, but still, you know, again, a lot of this volatility you see in owning investments is in the price return piece. And so if I'm someone who only cares about income stability, and I'm indifferent between price return, well, how does that affect my portfolio? Well, I mean, the first thing you have to do is think about, well, let's actually decompose the total return into the two pieces. And if you do this, kind of, again, you get very different efficient portfolios, right? So this is kind of showing you um, the one on the left um, is an efficient income return portfolio. The one on the right is an efficient total return portfolio. And, you know, there are similarities, you know, both have allocations, international bond and short-term bond, but the, in the income return portfolio has high, high allocations of things like preferred stock, emerging market bonds, and long-term credit, while the, the total return portfolio has more, has more of an equity piece, more tips, et cetera. So again, the idea here is just that when you change your perspective of what is optimal, it really can change your definition of the right portfolio. So the final topic um, for today's presentation is this idea of investing for the long run. Um, and there's this thing called, called time diversification. Have you guys heard of time diversification by chance? N no? Okay, well, I'll try to describe it. So um, there's this idea that, that equities become less volatile the longer that you hold them. So if you have a, for example, if you have a 20-year investment horizon that you can afford to have a more aggressive portfolio, okay, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense in terms of, you know, how, like, um, professors think about risk. 
right? Because the, you know, the duration you have to invest shouldn't affect your, your level of risk you take in your portfolio, right? So that's this idea of time diversification where you can actually have, um, you know, the risk of equities declines as you kind of move over longer time horizons. Now, there's been kind of a, deb a debate about this existing. Okay, and so there's kind of, you know, there's a whole host of people that take different sides here, but, you know, two kind of notable um, people that talk about this concept regularly are, are Zvi Bodhi and, and Jeremy Siegel, right? So, you know, Zvi is an interesting guy, and he, you know, he makes, he makes great points. He's written, you know, literature about this that says, you know, if you think about, about, about this idea of stocks becoming less risky over the long run, it doesn't make any sense at all. Right? When you learn about things like Black Scholes option pricing models, like the really the risk of equities, you know, should and does increase over longer investment time horizons. Okay, and then there's Jeremy Siegel. He's like, well, you know, like I get that argument. Okay, but let's look at the actual evidence. Okay, what is the actual empirical evidence of the risks of stocks over longer investment time horizons? Okay, do they become, you know, riskier or safer the longer that you hold them? And so there isn't kind of one right answer here, but the idea just is that, okay, how does investment duration affect the risk of securities? Okay, and so this is kind of showing you that concept. Okay, this is the, the annualized standard deviation for the return of, for real stocks, real bonds, and real bills. So bills are, think, think of that as cash, bonds are bonds, and stocks are stocks. This is uh, using US data going back to 1900. And what you'll notice here that's really neat is that the risk of holding stocks actually crosses over the risk of holding bonds at the 20-year mark. So what this suggests at a super high level, at least in the U.S. historically, is that if you have a 20-year investment time horizon, you're going you're to put the money in a box and come back in 20 years and check on the value, that holding stocks is just as risky as holding bonds. Okay? And if you've got a 30-year time horizon, actually holding stocks is less risky than holding bonds. Okay, well, there's a problem with this because, in theory, you know, stocks should be uh, random. Well, what's called a random walk. And it's funny, a random walk is actually based upon like a drunk guy leaving a bar where he goes, it's supposed to be like a random uh, outcome. And so if, if stocks are, are, are random, you know, there should be, no, you know, like this should not happen, right? There should be this kind of, you know, stocks should always be riskier than bonds, et cetera. But we, but we don't see this. So this actually suggests there's kind of a, a free lunch to investing right now. And that kind of begs the question, well, okay, it's existed in the U.S. We've seen this happen in the U.S., you know, going back to the 1700s, okay? But does it exist elsewhere? Okay, I think, I think too much of the research that people do and kind of um, empirically in finance, at least historically, is focused on U.S. returns. Well, they'll discover an anomaly that exists just in the U.S. alone. And so um, I wrote a paper with um, Wade Fow, who's at the American College, and Michael Fink, who's at Texas Tech, kind of asking this question, does this anomaly exist um, internationally? Okay, so if you just move away from saying, okay, this has existed in the U.S., does it still exist if I move to, say, Germany, France, or the U.K.? And what you see then is that this is just some, you know, basic information about, you know, 20 countries um, for, actually it's for 115 years. You create rolling distinct periods, all these different things. And so this is kind of um, the high-level conclusions. And there's, I guess there's a, there's a problem with the, the font here. But um, this is kind of the, the average result of those simulations. Okay, so... Um, you know, there's, there's five different levels of, of risk tolerance. There's, you know, very high going to very low as you move across time. And what you would expect to happen if there was no time diversification effect, these would be flat for the entire period, right? The optimal portfolio wouldn't change over time. So what, what this is showing you is um, your, the optimal equity allocation based upon your, your investment time horizon for different levels of risk conversion. And what this suggests is that, let's say that you are a very risk adverse person. So you'd have a, an allocation that's about 27% equities for one year investment time horizon. Okay, that same investor who is, who is very risk adverse should have an allocation that's in 70% stocks if they have a 20 year investment time horizon. That is their most efficient portfolio given their you know, target risk level. And so at the end of the day, this really does provide I think, strong evidence that you know, it really does make sense to think about um, you know, building portfolios on this idea of, of how long you have to invest. And then another important question is, 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 is okay, David, this has happened historically. Okay, there's, 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 you know, like the T-stats are very high. There's, there's really good evidence that's existed. Well, you know, is it going away? Right? Is this idea or this concept of, of investing for the long run, is it, is, it, is it getting stronger or weaker? Okay, it's actually getting stronger. Okay, um, and there's, there's kind of these two competing effects. Well, first off, the optimal equity allocation for short-term investors is going down. So if you have a very short time horizon, you know, the optimal allocation has decreased from about 50% stocks to 20% stocks over the last 100 or so years, okay? But the benefit to being a long-term investor 
has been increasing dramatically from 1% per year to 2.5% per year. And a question could be, well, why does this exist? Right? Why is it that, that there's a, a greater benefit now more than ever to be a long-term investor? I think it's because it's harder than ever to do so. Right? I mean, investors, you know, 40 years ago didn't have iPhones with stock market quotes that they can get every second. I think it's very difficult today to be a long-term investor and stay invested for the long haul. So I think that, that this is kind of a reward for keeping someone invested for, the, you know, invested for you know, 10 or 20 or 30 years. And so another question is, is well, okay, you know, this has existed. It may still exist. But you know, like, what does the return have to be on stocks? Or how bad does it have to get for this to go away? Right? And that's get really, really bad. And so this is showing you, um, you know, the expected, the, the equity risk premium required to eliminate the benefits of time diversification. And so there's, you know, there's lots of numbers on here. But, but stocks, just for example, would have to underperform bonds by 2% a year every year for 10 years for someone to not be better off having a more aggressive portfolio for a longer time horizon. So this is incredibly robust. There's really, really strong evidence that, that you know, for most investors, it makes sense to take on some risk if they have this longer investment time horizon. Um, so what are some kind of parting thoughts here? Well, first is that there really is kind of strong evidence that stocks can be more attractive for long-run investors. Okay, that, that really is like if you, are, if you are 25, 35, 40, if you are younger, you really should take on more risk in your portfolio because you'll actually have a better expected outcome uh, in 20 years versus having just bonds in your account. Um, there really is this kind of mean, run, a mean reversion that drives this long-run equity advantage. Um, and this is the obvious kind of reward for ignoring short-term performance. And I think that one of the kind of key things here is this idea of, of having a, a portfolio or a process to, um, to help someone maintain this focus. I'm a big fan of things like investment policy statements or um, target date funds or kind of just, a, you know, a more holistic portfolio that helps someone kind of keep this focus on the long run. And one example of this um, that's very behavioral is using what's called a bucket approach. I don't know if you guys have heard of buckets or not. Um, it's funny, you know, you know, buckets, you know, don't make any sense kind of analytically, right? So this is, this is the idea of, of a bucket portfolio where you kind of, where you, where you segment assets into account based upon when the client needs the money. This is, I think, it's quite common for retirees. So if you've got, you know, a retiree, you'll have a cash bucket that's going to last for, say, three years. You'll have a portfolio bucket and then be an annuity bucket. And in reality, um, buckets are, are totally behavioral. Right, if you give me a portfolio, I can create, you know, two buckets, eight buckets, 12 buckets. So there really shouldn't be any benefit to this in terms of the actual impact on the, on the outcome. But I think it does help clients understand how their portfolio is going to fund their retirement. But this also is evidence that actually makes sense kind of empirically. That it really does make sense to have someone have a, a more aggressive portfolio for a longer investment time horizon because there is this kind of long-run revision, uh, a long-term um, benefit to holding equities. Now... What are some conclusions of this? You know, first off, you know, how do you build kind of more optimal, optimized portfolios? And, you know, this is kind of the widget that a lot of us use today. We'll have a, a really kind of, you know, we'll call it a sexy optimizer. You can put all these fun inputs into it about, you know, asset classes, returns, et cetera. Well, I think this other stuff is really important, right? This idea of, you know, how long till I actually get to the goal? Right, you know, what are my unique preferences? Do I value income? Do I value stability? Um, what is my total wealth? Right, do I have, um, you know, what is my unique human capital? Do I have pension wealth? Do I have real estate? You know, how does those different assets affect this true portfolio? Another piece is taxes. Right, so the, the relative efficiency of asset classes changes when you add taxes into the equation. Because, you know, for example, you know, bonds, uh, if you hold, you know, you, you hold a bond till duration and you realize these coupons, it's taxed at, say, 35%, your marginal tax rate. Okay, stocks, you know, if you have a qualified dividend, it's taxed at, at 15%, or if it's a long-term game, also 15%. So the relative attractiveness of stocks versus bond changes uh, based upon taxes. I and mean, then finally, it's the goal. The goal to me is, it isn't the most important, but it's pretty close. Think about, you know, what are the risk factors of the goal, and how do I incorporate those aspects into the actual portfolio? And what this leads to is kind of different efficient frontiers, right? I showed you maybe, you know, 20 slides ago, two different portfolios with two different goals. And, and you know, this leads to an outcome where you have this perception of what could be an inefficient portfolio that's actually very efficient, right? What is the portfolio actually doing to help the client accomplish the goal? That's the most important thing. Right? You know, if you, if you kind of limit yourself to these standard models thinking about risk and return and, and, you know, and standard deviation, I think you might overlook the fact that if your client has a, this distinct liability with, this, with these distinct risk factors, um, you, know, you may not build the right portfolio based upon um, the traditional metrics. And then finally, 
I think there is really an art and science to doing this. Um, you know, I work with a lot of PhDs, and they like to talk about the, about the science part, but really it takes understanding your client. Right? Every client is different. They've got all these unique objectives, and I think that to really do a good job, you have to understand what they're trying to accomplish and work that into the overall equation. So I have to show you my disclosures because it's, it's the rule, um, but we can move on. So I guess that was the, that was the presentation. Um, I have time for questions. Hopefully I didn't um, overwhelm you with, with, with my presentation. Yep. <coughs> Mm -hmm. Do you also gross up or capitalize Social Security stream of income? I, I mean, for people that are kind of retiring now, I personally feel Social Security is going to be around for the long haul. It may not just be in the form that we use it, but do you use that also? That yeah, I mean, it's exactly like pension income. Mm -hmm. So with Social Security, I think the key is is what is the accrued benefit? Because someone who is exactly. 25, yeah. So yeah, I mean. So, Yes, and so we, we do what's called the mortality weighted net present value, which is the odds of someone living per year, and then what is the benefit going to be when they actually start receiving it. So that is part of our model. I mean, like, this maybe is a more esoteric thing. I mean, you know, we've had a lot of discussions internally, like, you know, what should we actually include or benefits for Social Security, you know, 30 years from now? And so, you know, in our, in our engines that we use, we actually use the current legislation because we don't like to forecast kind of policy changes. But an important kind of thing here now is, like, there's, there's new legislation that's going to remove a lot of the really neat benefits to Social Security claiming right now. And so, like, you don't know if you guys track this, but there's going to be there's new legislation that was going to remove a file and suspend and file and restrict from where you can claim Social Security, and that will really affect um, a lot of higher income clients. It will really, I think, it, it could reduce their benefits by fifty thousand dollars over their lifetime. And so, you know, we've been forecasting that, but it's going away. So we don't. We're going to we're going to add that in as soon as the um, legislation becomes final. But until then, we're still going to utilize it. That's the nature of this business, though. Correct. I mean, you know, capital gains tax at a maximum. Only for the highest 39 six uh, tax bracket. Mm -hmm. It's only 15% for people that are in the 25, 31, 33, uh, et cetera, brackets. Very real possibility that might be taken away. So all we can do is do the best with what we can with what we have right now. Yeah, I mean, I like to make the. And it's, I mean, that's the whole reason for getting together with clients on an ongoing basis. Yeah, so I'm, I'm in charge of the, a group that, that runs our, our, we call it the Wealth Forecast Engine. We actually have a million people, have more than 1.1 million today, that utilize our managed account service and 401k plans for advice and projections. And so, um, you, know, you know, our projections for all of them are going to be wrong. It's a guarantee. You know, hopefully not going to be totally wrong, but my thing is, is that the goal with these projections is to be reasonable, uh, but not be too extreme. Like I've heard some people, they run projections where they don't include Social Security. And you can do that, but it, it really devastates the outcome for a client. I think that it results in over savings. So I think that it's important to kind of find that balance between, you know, giving them good information and not kind of making, you know, too, um, too advanced of a projection. The question? Yeah, thanks for being here. I, I enjoyed that a lot. Um, I'm sitting here thinking, I agree with the gentleman over there that you know, a lot of what we do is mostly behavioral, mm -hmm. but I do, I do like this analysis. Uh, it makes a lot of sense to me. But what I was curious about, uh, towards the end of the presentation, you talked about um, more money going into equities at this point or makes sense from an asset allocation change. How much of that do you think is um, a result of where we are with current interest rates? So that was really more of a strategic decision versus a tactical one. I, don't, I, wasn't, I, was, I wasn't trying to say that today people should have more in equities than they have historically. But I mean, I think that, you know, I'm not like a tactical market timing kind of guy. I'm a very kind of long term. Right? But I do today see a lot of risk on both ends of the spectrum, right? If you're very conservative and you're earning a negative real return every year of 2% or, you know, that's very dangerous. So is having all stocks. I mean, we really preach this idea of just diversification, you know, you know across asset classes and not really kind of putting too much in stocks or bonds, but especially for those that are near retirement. Does that answer your question? But, I mean, just in, in point two, I mean, our projections for the returns on stocks right now are the lowest they've ever been in our history. We're only projecting a return on large cap stocks for the next 10 years of about 6%. Okay, and, and what really hurts is that's before fees, it's before taxes, it's before inflation, it's before volatility drag. And so you know, when you add all that together, you know, it's realistic that an investor today who invests in an you know, equity portfolio may only earn 3% real going forward in the next few years. That's, that's our expectation. We could, we could be wrong, we hope we're wrong, but it's a very um, pessimistic forecast. Other, I'm going to wait. Other questions? Okay, yeah. Oh, no, let's, let's, yeah. As an advisor who deals with this every day, I would agree that 
a lot of clients can probably afford to be a lot more conservative. Um, but you've got their risk, risk uh, capacity, which is time horizon, and then you've got their risk tolerance, which is what's in their stomach. And my experience is that when you get to be about age 60, a switch flips, and all of a sudden, protection becomes way more important than growth, and it's very hard to persuade someone, even though the, on paper um, you can back it up, that they need to be more aggressive. At that point, they're ready to get more conservative, and they're willing to sacrifice returns for some peace of mind. Right, so I think the idea of like a rising glide path is, is incredibly inefficient behavior. I think that people become, I mean, you know, I'm not going to tell my grandma, hey, grandma, let's move to socks now. Like, she's 89 years old. And so I think that for us, the idea is like, you know, so there's no perfect number. Like, you know, we like around 40 percentage stocks when you retire, then going down from there. So I think that, to your point, it's hard to talk investors into being more aggressive. You know, some may argue that they should, that you have to be more aggressive to, you know, kind of realize, you know, this, this income stream. I think, to me, the issue is, is, you know, what are you comfortable with? Because if you're going to, if we have another 2008 and you pull out in 2009, you know, th there's no do-overs for retirees at all. So the key is, you know, finding that right balance between, you know, growth and income. Question? Yeah. Um, I think as a CFP practitioner um, and having worked in the industry for about 30, 31 years, now more so than ever, the key to risk management is education and spending time with the client to explain the why of what you're talking about in terms of perhaps a little bit more of an enhanced allocation to equities. Uh, makes incredible sense. The other thing that I get frequently is people say, oh, hell, I'm not going to be around until I'm 80. And uh, there's an excellent website, write it down, uh, called living2to100.com. And I always have my clients go there. It's a great site that you can fill out medical history, you can fill out diet, exercise, et cetera, et cetera. And it kind of gives you a rough idea of how, how long you're going to be alive. Plus, what you can do to extend your life. Yeah, I've actually been to the website. I mean, so I guess, you know, I use, I like to use the word expectations on education. It's often, in my experience, hard to, hard to teach clients about um, these concepts, but I want, I want them to understand what the expectations are. You know, I think that, you know, people, you know, will hear things and they say, well, stocks return 12% per year. That's the expectation. That's not the expectation. The expectation is that, you know, that stocks to do, you know, 5% a year on average for the next 10 years. To me, that's the key. Could you circle back to the chart about risk of certain in working in certain industries? Sure. And considering that, uh, particularly what uh, government worker that's pretty stable versus realtor versus other industries, I, that's that's important. If you could elaborate on that a little bit. So I have a I have a new paper that's coming out in the very near future called the portfolio implications of job specific risk that actually looks at like 600 different jobs. It's a much better nuanced perspective of the risks by jobs. This is this was kind of our first pass. The next one kind of decomposes. Uh, it does it's cross sectional so industries and occupations. But this is kind of an idea that just the key here is just that the risks of different jobs are very different across industries. Does that make sense? Well, I mean, so, you know, well, I mean, I mean, it, at a high level, I think a lot of these are somewhat intuitive. I mean, uh, you know, government was the most conservative. And so, I mean, with government, it's kind of unique because the question is, is, you know, yes, someone who works in government has a safer job, but then, you know, at first glance, you say that they should have a more aggressive portfolio, but they may also have a preference for um, less risk. I mean, things like, you know, finance was actually quite surprising. I was expecting finance to be riskier. Uh, the riskiest of all was actually lodging, um, which is like working for hotels. But I mean, I think that if you just think about the risks of these stocks, I mean, you know, construction was very risky. I mean, if you look at just construction jobs, they went from something like, like 5.2 million in 2007 to like 3.6 million two years later. There's a huge shock in the industry, you know, post-2008. Uh, manufacturing, you know, usually quite safe. Uh, transportation, quite safe. Same as utilities. I think that, that, that most of these, you know, results kind of should track your general expectations of the risk by these industries. Any more questions? Uh, I've, I've got just a simple question, I think. How far are we from having a switch we can throw on Money Guide Pro or something like that to actually incorporate these ideas as a, as a 
point of reference to talk to our clients about? So I don't know about Money Guide Pro. Well, I just um, you or, said so you know I think that you know Morningstar as a firm is really getting behind this idea of, of total wealth. There might be like a new name for it soon. I'm not good at naming things as it turns out. Um, but you know I'd like to think that you know this is where we're moving as a firm, where you can tell us you know you've got you know this much in pensions, this much in you know this is where you live. This is your job, this is your age, and given all these different factors, this is the right portfolio for you. So starting with kind of a base target and then moving around that based upon your kind of unique, your unique risk attributes. So, I mean, not, not next year, maybe the following year. Yeah. Okay, well, that, I mean, that's good, because I find it useful. I, it's just as a FYI, I mean, I remember when I first started working here as a faculty member, and I, people would come to me to talk about financial planning. And here we are in a, in, a, in a defined benefit university, and I had employees that have been here 30 years, so they've got, you know, 65, 70 percent of their income protected in defined benefit, yeah. and they're and they're worried about their bond allocation vis-a-vis -vis their equity. And I'm saying, you got all the bonds you'd ever want right. sitting over there with your defined benefit plan. Let's let's focus on risk here. They've been very grateful because that was yeah. in the pre-90s, and they've did very well during that time period. I think people are often a bit too myopic. They only view the risk of their portfolio in isolation. Right. They don't think about you know, oh, if my portfolio goes down to those people. They still have most of their income that's guaranteed for life, so they can actually afford to take a more risk because they have that bond. -like like asset and their kind of total wealth. That's, that's right. That's good. Are there, are there any more questions? Oh, here we go. Yeah, the other thing is, is that, you know, I, I always try and tell clients, just because you're retiring doesn't mean... Let's get you on the machine. Just because you're retiring doesn't mean you have to put your money into retirement. Yeah. And if somebody is 65 years old, how long do you think you're going to be around? 20 years? Okay. So... 45 years ago, let's pretend you were 65 back then. Would you want, have wanted to be in all fixed income, all conservative bonds this 20 years hence? And, and I think they, that, that at least starts to crack open the door a little bit. I'm not trying to hammer anybody into being overly aggressive, but at least keep the door open to allow for some equities, because even though we really haven't experienced any inflation in the last, what, 10 years, it, it can come back, but even with 3% inflation, price is still double in 20, 24 years. Yeah, I was talking to my father-in-law. He's actually rolling over his, uh, this pension to an IRA, and he was like, should I invest it all, all in bonds? And I'm like, well, you're, you're not dying. You're retiring. So that was my thing. So no more questions at all? Well, thank you.